Welcome to Into Theology. We're looking at Thomas Aquinas today in his Summa, and we are in, as a question is 22 and 23 on providence and predestination. And Aquinas himself says that um, basically providence, or sorry, predestination is a part of providence, providence being a bigger category. So uh, instead of reading in lieu of that, I think we're just going to talk about predestination. So why don't well, we're basically just going to argue here that uh, that Aquinas is reformed. And yes. so he's a Calvinist, basically. And so yes. this this episode will put all the all the people that are suspicious of, of Thomism and, and coming into Protestantism and stuff. It's going to put it all to rest. So this is exactly correct. I mean, Thomas was reading John Calvin and uh and definitely picked up on his view of predestination. Because uh, as we know, predestination is a particularly reformed view that was invented. Only the reformed. 16th century when we first started reading the Bible again, because before that, nobody read the Bible except for the trail of blood from yeah. after That's Peter right. died or whatever. <laughs> um, but but I, this is uh, not because of this reading, but just for my own personal interest. I, I made this good context. I've been reading a lot in the predestination debates, so I've been reading some of the uh, the Pelagian, Plagius versus Augustine stuff, and then later the Fulgentius around the Council of Orange kind of period, uh, and then um, I'm also reading Gottschalk of Orbay and so on. And one of the things that strikes me, you can read, uh, 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 was it is, is it a Cedor of Seville? I can't remember. Is it Cedor? Yeah. I can't uh, you can read him. You can read Fulgentius. You can read Augustine. You can read um, uh, who wrote the Moralia of Job? Is that Gregory? Oh, uh, Gregory, Gregory the Great. You can. Uh, they all. They all agree on predestination. Predestination is not a novel teaching. It is it's in it's Cyprian of Carthage, for goodness' sake, who is I believe he's two hundreds of memory serves. Um, meaning this, this is a normal basic truth, and the reason why Pelagius it's even in the Bible. It's, it's even in the Bible. Yeah, I actually think that that Thomas actually quotes the Bible on predestination, doesn't he? Oh yeah, Frequently. look at that Romans eight thirty. <laughs> he quotes Romans eight thirty. He wants to know if men are predestined, so he quotes Romans 8.30. I mean, like, this is one of the weirdest sort of narratives I heard is essentially the Reformed get into predestination, and uh, but, but, you know, the Catholics didn't, which is just completely wrong. I mean, this is why the church was Reformed, because the church that was a Roman church reformed according to the Word of God, and they saw these same things that we think we see. It's just a weird sense of history. But one of the things I, was, I want to say briefly to start the conversation is that the doctrine of predestination in its made in its major parts in the Reformation and Augustine in particular is always simply to say it's to affirm that um predestination makes grace free. It's always mm-hmm. about God's care for us. And it's always about there's no such thing as preceding merits that would provide our salvation as a reward. God didn't look into the future and see that we were so good and therefore bestow grace on us. Grace is free. Because it has nothing to do with our preceding good works, our foreknown good works, our performance. It's not in us. It's, you know, from God. And I think a lot of times predestination debates get into these um, abstract notions of God's sovereignty and then our human free choice, which is actually outside of, of most of the, emph- and not that it's outside of all of it, but it's the emphasis is always on God's grace. And even in the Reformation, this is the thing. There's no congruent or condign merit that we can do, one that would require God's reward or one that would be reward on the basis of God's disagreement to reward what is in us uh, that that merit that, that makes God justify us. Because if that were the case, then grace would be reliant on something in us, however you word it. But predestination is always about the goodness of God. So Augustine and Fulgentius define it this way. Um, basically, pre- grace is predestination applied in time. Good way to think of it, but it's it's interesting. I mean, we we kind of jumped in at predestination instead of uh, providence. providence first. But what you're saying there makes makes sense with what what Thomas says in um, in, in what is this uh, on predestination? Yeah, so twenty three, the fifth article, which is on the bottom of one seventy six, where you're talking about like no merit or anything, and it's amazing, right? Like when you read this, just his uh, on the contrary. Um, because the question is that, that's being asked is whether uh, whether the foreknowledge of merits is the cause of predestination. So the mm-hmm. whole idea is like, does God look forward, see, you know, that we do good works, we perform works of merit, and then that causes predestination. And uh, and he's very much against this. And it's, you know, for Thomas, the big Roman Catholic 
you know, theolo- you know, the official teacher of the Roman Catholic Church in terms of their dogma. When you read this, you're like, wow, like this, you would not think that this was what we would think of as the Roman Catholic today, saying these sorts of things. He appeals to Titus 3, 5, uh, where he says, the apostle says, not by works of justice, uh, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So he's basically like showing like that Paul rules out the possibility of merits. And then he, he says right after he says, but as he saved us, so he predestined that we should be saved. Therefore, foreknowledge of merits is not the cause or reason of predestination. And so he's totally excluding any kind of possibility of works, merit, any of that kind of stuff as a cause. The only cause of predestination is God. Yeah. And then he quotes 2 Corinthians 3, 5, a little bit after that. It says, we're not sufficient to think of anything of ourselves as of ourselves. Yeah. And so he, he, he goes on and on. Like, even like the next parts, he says, some have said that pre-existing merits in this life are the reason and cause of the effect of predestination. But the Pelagians taught that the beginning of doing well came from us and the consummation from God. So that it came about that the effect of predestination was granted to one and not to another, based because you had merit, right? But because the one uh, made a beginning by preparing, whereas the other did not. But against this, we have the saying of the apostle. Again, he quotes scripture against this idea. We are not sufficient to think anything of ourselves as of ourselves, even the beginning of faith, beginning of salvation. And he says, so, and so others said that merits following the effect of predestination are the reason of predestination, giving us to understand that God gives grace to a person. Again, predestination and grace is the, is the connection. And preordains that he will give it because he knows beforehand that he will make good use of that grace. Again, grace is the point. As if a king were to give a horse to a soldier because he knows he will make good use of it. It's not the point that God says, oh, if I predestine this person, he'll make a good use of our, my grace. It's not what's going on here. Yeah. But these seem to have drawn a distinction between that which flows from grace and that which flows from free will, as if the same thing cannot come from both. Man, this is so important. This is, he's exactly, this is the same argument of Fulgentius and Augustine. It's like almost word for word, which is interesting because I just read them. But what huh. both of them say, like literally, is look, be, the reason why God enables our free choice by grace, he gives us a good will so that we can buy free choice once again because we lost the good will in the fall. Choose. And we freely uh, believe because God predestined us to receive the grace to have a good will. Uh, it's it's really, it's, it's it, just so funny. Well, and it fits, I mean, like maybe this is a segue to get us back to question 22 where we should start like that. That relates to all these questions that he brings up here in terms of like primary and secondary causality. And yeah. how like in, you know, the, it's funny the way Creep does it on page 173 talking about uh, God having immediate providence over everything. Uh, the, all he gives is like a little bit of a, an I answer that, but it's, and it's, it's funny, but he gets to the point uh, where he says, I answer that there are certain intermediaries of God's providence for he governs things inferior by superior, not on account of any defect in his power, but by reason of the abundance of his goodness so that the dignity of causality is imparted even to creatures. Right. So that fits with then what you're saying, right? In that like God has absolute providential control over all things. And yet within that, he ordains that rational creatures, because that's really what predestination pertains to, right? Like, pro- providence is God's governance over absolutely everything he's created. And then predestination pertains to that, which is rational, namely the human. And, and so even in that case, right? So God, just like God will use secondary causes in providence, he will do the same for us in that he allows us the secondary causes to actually make genuinely free choices all within the purview of his absolute sovereignty over everything. And notice in the, in the, in the lines we right afterwards, it's all based on his abundant goodness, which is the same thing yeah. he's on page 177. It says that predestination has its foundation in the goodness of God, which is precisely what Fulgentius and Augustine say is the sole cause of predestination, God's goodness. There's yeah. no other cause but God's goodness. It's first cause because it's, it's his will, but right. that is good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it's and, all, and funny, funny enough, this actually brings us all the way back then really to the first article under question 22 about whether or not it can be attributed, like where providence should it be suitably attributed to God. And then mm-hmm. again, note like the language of of goodness here in how, you know, God creates. So pro, pro, he defines in this article right at the very end of this kind of uh, of that paragraph there, that opening one. Um, where he says, I think it's in this one. Yeah, providence is defined. He says, uh, it is necessary that the type of the order of things uh, towards their end should pre-exist in the divine mind and the type of things ordered towards an end is properly speaking providence right so what how does thomas uh, define providence as anything that is ordered towards this end 
and then divine goodness will come into play, right? Um, so he says it is the start of the beginning then of that. Uh, it is necessary to attribute providence to God for all the good that is in created things has been created by God, as was shown above. Uh, in created things, good is found not only as regards their substance, but also as regards their order towards an end, uh, and especially their last end, which, as was said above, is the divine goodness. This good of order existing in things created is itself created by God, right? So this goes back to what you're saying. So um, this whole motivation behind what God is doing in terms of his ordering of the universe by providence and then drawing some to himself through predestination is all grounded in this notion of goodness, the order, the good order that he's given and how everything that the way he has made the human soul is that it desires that which is good. God being the ultimate good, everything is ultimately to, you know, directed towards him. And you want to know how Aquinas is more biblical than a lot of people who claim the reformed heritage today? Because he quotes the Bible. Quotes the Bible. But um, the Bible uh, actually uses the word predestination for the application of grace. It doesn't actually talk, as far as I can remember, regularly or very much at all about predestination in terms of reprobation. There's a distinction in terminology because predestination towards the good is something that is um, is about the application of grace. And Peter Martin Vermeule has this whole thing that... He doesn't feel comfortable talking about double predestination simply because the biblical language leads us to say that predestination is towards grace. And so I think the language that Aquinas uses is he permits people yeah, to uh, permits them. And I believe yeah. that's the language. I can't remember exactly. I'm pretty sure Vermeule goes in that direction as well. And it's what it seems like, not that you, you can of course say in God's providence, there's, there's a, there's the, you know, it's all there. Like that's not what I'm getting at. But when you're when people emphasize double predestination so strongly, I think they're not quite as biblical as they should be. I think the word permit, I know Peter talks about how there's people who they were destined for this and so on. So there's there's a, there's a sense in which scripture has some of that language. But overwhelmingly, like in Romans 8 and other places, or in Ephesians 1, the, the language of ch- chosen or predestination or called is for the application of grace because it's based on God's uh, goodness, which is the sole cause of grace. Yeah. And permitting is a sort of non-application of that particular grace to allow us to to go on our own way, more or less, according to the level of secondary causal, cause, causology. Causology, I, mean, I can't even talk. Causes. Stuff. I mean, he basically, like what you just said there, defines reprobation as, as permission um you know, on, one, on 176 so it's a kind of uh in the it's a the i answer that uh okay. for for uh the fourth article so he says i answer that as men are ordained to eternal life through the providence of god it is likewise uh, it likewise is part of that providence to permit some to fall yeah. away from that end this is called reprobation and so yeah I, I, you're exactly right and and uh and 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 actually his reply to it so the objection two for that was uh if god reprobates any man it should be necessary for reprobation to have some relation to the reprobate as predestination has to this to the predestined predestined and he answers that by saying uh, reprobation differs in its causality from predestination right. uh this latter is the cause both of what is expected in the future life by the predestined namely glory and of what is received in this life, namely grace. Reprobation, however, is not the cause of what is in the present, namely sin, but it is the cause of abandonment by God. Because sin is is our level of causality. God can't cause sin in that that direct sense. That's so... See, I... I really... Like, I don't mind when you say, because God controls everything, there's, you know, everything's in his hands. I I get that. But but some people almost seem to delight in double predestination, delight in saying that God causes people to be damned but the bible is pretty clear ezekiel 18 for example where god is quoted as saying i don't delight in the death of anyone even the wicked no so uh, i think aquinas will later make this distinction when it comes to hell we delight in the justice but not actually in the suffering yeah distinction there i i have to i don't I, that's just on i don't know that i have to read that i think i've heard someone say that so i don't know for sure if he says it that way but um i, I just think there's something so important there and i think it's Oh, I think we need to be really careful when we really get into God's sovereignty. Like Gottschalk of Orbe, who I've been reading just recently, one of his problems is he's so into syllogistic reasoning that he goes almost beyond scripture. And it, it seems like he delights in double predestination. Mm-hmm. But the Bible overwhelmingly, again, talks about predestination as the application of grace. 
you know, in terms of calling and justification and glory, like, like Aquinas just said, I, I just, it really, to me, this abandonment of God is, is more of a, it's not something that we should celebrate. Yeah. And it, and it, it also like, this, this is where like all the scholastic distinctions are so helpful, right? Because you have to be so careful in how you actually speak about God in, in, in these sort of, um, in this regard, because uh -huh. what he's doing, what he's doing is, is by locating it with sin, right? So he says reprobation is not the cause of what is in the present, namely sin, but is the cause of abandonment of God. It is the cause, however, of what is assigned in the future, namely eternal right. punishment. Guilt proceeds from the free will of the person who is reprobated and deserted by grace. Yeah, so where, where does the where does it all where is it really located in terms of like it's located in the in in the human in the sinful human will. Uh, primarily uh, in terms of like being and able to speak to God in a way that, that protects him as right. though he created us only to damn us. And, and what, what makes this like, what do I hear this? Sometimes people say, well, we don't have, you know, free, free choice. They're like, well, but the, the whole Bible assumes that you do. I mean, choose this day whom you will serve. <laughs> like, right. So what is going on there? Well, you need to be able to have that free choice so that the cause of sin is your choice not God, or else how would you be accountable for all the things the Bible holds us accountable for? Because it puts the blame on us. If you ask the question, whenever it talks about sin, where does it place the blame? And if it's always on us, we must be the cause of that blame. And this is the whole Romans one through three argument. And if you're like, well, Paul doesn't use the language of free choice. Well, he does say that you um, not only do these things, but commend those who do them as well. What is that if not you choosing to sin and keep, like, you know what I mean? Like you don't need the technical language to, to prove this. It's just, it's a bizarre argument to me that sometimes people deny free choice to this, the point that they fall into uh, to the ditch of fatalism. We don't want to fall into fatalism or into the ditch of um, Epicureanism where there's no providence. But what Aquinas does but here. It's really between Stoicism and Epic Epicureanism in that sense, right? Like a fatalism on the one side to like something that's just totally chaotic right. on the other. Yeah, but I think what's really, um, you know, what Aquinas says really well is he says, he doesn't quite say, this, well, he does say it in these words, but um, later reformed will say it a bit more clearly in my opinion. But basically, God as first cause enables our contingent choices. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, there's different orders of causality. God doesn't work on the order of like time and sequence. Just in the the fact of creating us outside of time beyond all temporal considerations, he actually enables our free choices. And you need that or else, you know, you can't be accountable. Now, everyone, by the way, says there's a limit. I, I can't fly. I can't be an NBA basketball player and I can't do works of merit. So therefore, I can't believe unless God changes my bad will to a good will. That's that, of course, is that's everywhere. It, I, it says somewhere too, like, doesn't it say somewhere where he locates God as the efficient cause? of is it when because he gets into this distinction between universal and particular causes right yeah. and I can't, is it there where he talks about god as being an efficient cause can't uh -huh. find it it's uh, i'm looking at one page 172 on the in the reply to objection one uh i guess I not I, I i thought i read something about him being an efficient cause somewhere um, he sort of says it there but he also kind of says it on page um 177 at the bottom there the bottom half where he says now there is no distinction between what flows from free will and what is a predestination as there is no distinction between what flows from a secondary cause and from a first cause right but the providence of god produces effects so providence in here is kind of like an efficient cause uh, well okay produce effects through the operation of secondary causes as was shown above yeah or that which flows from free will is also a predestination so there's a little bit but it's not quite what you just said is it no, he, I, I I swear I read something recently in him where he actually uses like it was either effective cause, efficient cause. I can't, I can't remember. Well, there's first agent cause at the uh, top of one seventy two. First agent mm -hmm. sometimes it means like the efficient cause. This yeah. is made evident thus for since every agent acts for an end, the order and effects towards the end extends as far as the causality of the first agent extends. It necessarily falls that all things and as much as they participate in existence must likewise be subject to divine pro providence. So first agent could mean efficient cause. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I read the actual term. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, it's interesting that he gets into like the whole question of like the nature of luck and chance and things like that in here and like um, what things are fortuitous or fortune oriented. And uh, in, in his reply to objection one on, uh, you know, uh, on the second article, uh, objection, objection one on, on the bottom of page 171 it says 
the objection says, it seems that everything is not subject to divine providence for nothing foreseen can happen by chance. If then everything was foreseen by God, there uh, nothing would happen by chance and thus hazard or luck would disappear, which is against common opinion. So he's like, well, because people use the language of luck or hazardous events and things like that that are unforeseen, uh, therefore God can't have predestination. And then he replies to it and he makes this distinction between universal and particular causes yeah. in the reply yeah. objection one, which is kind of interesting because it's like it it allows the Christian to kind of kind of use the language of chance in a very kind of like specific way. So you can actually talk about it uh, in that. And, and he gives an example, I think, right, by the two people that meet each other, uh, two servants. Anyway, yeah. he says, uh, he says, a thing can escape the order of a particular cause but not the order of a universal cause. And so that it this this language here too almost reminds me of uh, remember that very famous article that John Piper wrote like year wrote years ago uh, uh are there two wills in god? It's kind of like the same sort of thing, right? The distinction between the universal and particular cause. So he's saying when it comes to universal causality, there's no possibility that chance, luck or anything will come into play. But when it comes to particular causes, which is kind of like almost from our ground level looking outward or lo looking I know. out sorry i gotta pause is. you when you stick your hand up like this zoom does the hand thing and that's what must be what you did earlier because it, uh... it recognizes you're doing this and i think because i'm the host it probably doesn't work for me but anyways that's what's happening weird okay okay right. but you, you, um, you won't. <laughs> even though i cut anyway. you off <laughs> stupid zoom um so yeah he's making this distinction so when it comes to universal causality no possibility of chance whatsoever when it comes to particular causality from sort of like the human level then there is these the, you can at least use that language um so he says since then this is still on pa middle of one pa uh, page 172 since then all particular causes are included under the universal cause right so even particular causality is still under the the larger umbrella of a universal cause um, he says, uh, it could not be that any effect should take place outside the range of that universal cause. So far then as an effect escapes the order of a particular cause, it is said to be casual or fortuitous in respect to that cause. So not in respect to universal cause, but in respect to particular cause. Um, and he says, if we regard the universal cause outside whose range, no effect can happen. It, it is said to be foreseen. Thus, for instance, the meeting of two servants, Although to them it appears a chance circumstance has been fully foreseen by their master who has purposely sent them to meet at the one place in such a way that the one knows not about the other. It's just interesting. Like he's he's basically saying, like, when it comes to universal causality, no potential for any kind of like chance occurrence. But when it comes to particular causality, which is under the rubric of universal cause, there can be from the perspective of the agents who are sort of part of the particular causality. I know that sounds like a mouthful of, of stuff, but it, it's helpful because it's just like, he's making these careful right. distinctions that allows us from our perspective to be able to speak of like a chance encounter that from right. God's universal perspective was not chance at all. Yeah, I think maybe an easy way to think about it. I mean, Lord Master, I think helps is like, God may order it so that you and I bump into each other at the mall and we're like, oh, I didn't know I'd see you here. Well, God, yeah. did. you and I didn't. We're the particular cause as it yeah. were and from our contingent kind of perspective and all that we are think oh that's super cool like i didn't expect to see you here like lucky we had a, you know i wanted to catch up with you or whatever but god knew and that was part of his universal ordering ordering I, th I think that's kind of what he's getting at to make it more yeah and i think like the causality behind both in terms of universal in particular is helpful in that like uh, a, we don't have to like de deny anything of God in terms of his providential control of absolutely everything, but it actually allows, because it is a true second kind of like particular causes kind of like related in a true way to secondary causality. We can actually say, oh, that was like genuinely unexpected, genuinely a, a free contingent encounter between two people that seemed entirely for, you know, fortuitous or, or or chance oriented and we can speak really in that sense like whoa this was cool you know i'm so glad that this happened but we know that god's behind it ultimately so if god permits evil to happen um how does that work i mean if look at the page on, on page 173 at the top the yes yeah. article there it has this interesting thing about how uh, it belongs to god's providence to permit certain defects in particular effects that the perfect good of the universe may not be hindered yeah, it's almost like a greater good argument that he gives here. 
Interesting. For, if all evil were prevented, much good would be absent from the universe. And here's some examples. A lion would cease to live yeah. if there were no slain of animals. And there would be no patience of martyrs if there were no tyrannical persecution. I mean, how would you grow if you had no obstacles in life? If you think of it that way, like how would you, if you, if you were not, if you're doing judo and you had no struggle, how would you become a better judo athlete? Right. Like, you need to have that in order to gain the patience of martyrdom. You need a, a tyrant. So says, thus Augustine says in his Enchiridion, Almighty God would in no wise permit evil to exist in his works unless he were so almighty and so good as to produce good even from evil. And so there, even in God's providence, he includes it, but the, the verb he uses is permit because the cause, the, 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 so the natural, the, 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 it's in God's providence, but the cause of the individual tyrants evil to the Christian is, is them. So was it Acts 4 or Acts 2? Jesus Christ died by the hands of lawless men. It's totally yep. put onto them. And yet it also says, I can't remember if it's two or four, it might be both. It's two. According to the 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 uh, the foreknowledge and plan of God. I mean, both both passages say something similar. I just can't remember which is which. So you have Christ going to the cross according to God's foreknowledge, his predestination. He's predestined to the cross. And yet it's he dies at the hands of lawless men. So there's a particular cause, the lawless men, in the universal cause, which is who's always going to go to the cross. Yeah. And so God uses the adversity, you might say, of lawless men to crucify his the Christ so that salvation would come out of this evil. And so there, there's something to I mean, I, I know he doesn't go into it, but there's something about the fall of man that is particularly Adam and Eve's fault. And yet is there something better as a consequence? So, uh, so, like, are you thinking of like the whole Felix Culpa blessed? Well, I don't fall. know. I, I don't actually know. I'm not saying I know, but like, just thinking of like heaven and hell and all this, the, these eternal destinies and all that kind of stuff. Is there is there something that we have now that we would never have? I mean, angels long to look into the the mystery of godliness. You know what I mean? What are they looking I mean, at? Why are they so? I think I if you connect. I think if you connect it to that whole question of like the Felix. Culpa. Um, we wouldn't know that God was willing to die for human sin had humans not sinned, right? So there's here, given what he, the, using the language of Thomas here, is that God allows for these imperfections or whatever to happen within his creation in order to demonstrate these greater goods. And so, you know, human sin is permitted in order then for God to demonstrate this greater good. I mean, there's a number of, of goods that are that are demonstrated by by the fall, right? Like God gets to demonstrate His justice, um, which we would never have understood. We probably wouldn't have understood had there been no fall or no evil. Um, it's very hard to understand God's justice. Yeah, His justice God. is. I mean, He's going to always act justly towards us, so we could know that, you know. But we wouldn't know the extent of that justice in, li in light of human sin. And uh, and the same goes for the whole question of like, we wouldn't know the extent of His love in that he was actually willing to die for rebellious sinners. And so there's a sense then too, where we can, we know these greater goods that we would never have known in such a way. I mean, we could have known it, I guess, in like a very academic sense, but we wouldn't have known it in an experiential sense that like God actually died for me. Um, he gets into this in question 48 and 49. Uh, uh, evil in particular so we'll, we'll probably yeah. find out exactly how well, he, i mean he brings evil in um where is it uh at the, the yeah in the second article uh the objection to um the and the, the the objection to basically says you know so the question is whether everything is subject to the providence of god the second objection uh, says a wise provider excludes any defect or evil as far as he can from those uh, over whom he has care uh, but we see many evils existing, either then God, and this is the classic articulation of the problem of evil, uh, either then God cannot hinder these and thus is not omnipotent or all-powerful, or else he does not have care for everything. So maybe he's not all-loving if evil exists, right? So there's your classic evil, problem of evil argument. And then that's where uh, uh, Thomas in the reply to objection to will use this distinction between you know, universal versus particular providence. And he says in reply to objection two, he says it is otherwise with one who has care of a particular thing and one whose providence is universal because a particular provider excludes all defects from what is subject to his care as far as he can. Whereas one who provides universally allows some little defect to remain lest the good of the whole should be hindered. 
Um, so it's, it's interesting, like what we we're all just saying there is this way of answering the problem of evil, which is not the typical way that you would, you know, you hear, you know, Alvin Plantinger or somebody say, well, that's not exactly how we want to formulate the problem of evil from a Christian perspective. Anyway, um, Thomas is almost like takes it for granted and then says, hey, but this is just how it goes <laughs> um, with the, the different. That... Um, but... I, before we finish, I do want to look at page 174 because it sort of. I mentioned earlier how like you can have both free choice and God's predestination. It's the same, same act. Like, how does that work? He actually yeah. kind of explains how with his, um, on the contrary on page 174, which is question 22, the fourth article, he quotes uh, Dionysius who says to corrupt nature is not the work of Providence. But then he says, Aquinas says, but it is in the nature of some things to be contingent. So divine Providence does not therefore impose any necessity upon things. So as to destroy their contingency. I answer that divine providence imposes necessity upon some things, not upon all, as some formerly believed, for to providence it belongs to order things towards an end, so towards goodness. Now, after the divine goodness, which is an intrinsic end to all things, so again, divine extrinsic, goodness, extrinsic. sorry, extrinsic, the principal good in things themselves is the perfection of the universe, which would not be where not all grades have been found in things. Once it pertains to divine providence to produce every grade of being. And thus it has prepared for some things necessary causes so that they happen of necessity. For others, contingent causes that they may happen by contingency according to the nature of their proximate causes. Reply to objection one is interesting to the effect of divine providence is not only that things should happen somehow, but that they should happen either by necessity or by contingency. Therefore, whatever hap therefore, whatsoever divine providence ordains to happen infallibly and of necessity happens in infallibly and of necessity. And that happens and that I guess that which happens from contingency, which the plan that which the plan divine providence conceives to happen from contingency. So God's providence is over both necessary things and contingent things, free things and necessary things, we might say. And, and that, that those, those contingent things act freely accord, in proportion to their nature. In proportion to their nature. So a rock, you know, <laughs> but like for yeah, us, we're rational creatures, we have free choice. So there's a sense in which God's providence plans for, enables, frees up through, it, through the application of grace, Holy Spirit in our hearts, our free, our free reception of, of the gospel. Yeah. And that's like, uh, you know, William, I think it's William Perkins. He either says it, it's this, or that's his view described. He calls it synchronic contingency. But there's this idea yeah. of God's will and our will uh, are on different orders of being. So there's one is the God's order way outside of ours, and ours is on the order of created being. We're both doing the same act at once. God is, we are freely choosing to believe, and God is enabling that belief at the same time in different ways. Yeah. And it's, it's different, and there's no contradiction. Aquinas says the same thing, actually, or similar thing. There's no contradiction because one's the order of first-level causality, which is beyond space and time, and one is the level of second-order causality, which is ours, which is in space and time. And so there's no ability. I can't con contradict God's will. There's not even a capacity in my nature to do so. Like, I cannot impede the will of God. The calling and gifts of God are irrevocable. There is no, there's nothing I can, Paul, that's Paul's language. There's right. nothing I can do. Well, uh, Thomas quotes it, didn't he? Um, uh, really? Because that'd be yeah. interesting. That's a key verse in Augustine's argument too, which is just so funny that I'm, because I'm reading them together. Yeah. Um, uh, even if he doesn't quote him, I'm sure it's it's probably in the longer answer if it's not. It, but it's just so no, important. It's, uh, it's, it's on the bottom of 178. Uh, oh. Whether predestination, oh, this is interesting. It can be furthered by the prayers of the saints. Remember, and he makes that, he makes the right. same distinction, right? He says, when it comes to like, you know, absolute divine preordination, nothing can affect it. Like no. prayers, works, nothing. Then he says, though, when it comes to the effect of it, of course, prayer and anything else can can be a part of it, right? Yeah. And then, but but right before that, he quotes uh, Romans eleven. I thought it was a Romans eleven twenty six, but it's eleven twenty nine. Yeah, twenty nine. Um, he says the gifts and the calling of God are. It's interesting. Without repentance is uh, is the translation there, right? It's yeah. not. Like, it's not to be taken back. So. Yeah, I just think it's it's just so important. And then he goes into the levels of causality, actually, right there. Yeah, so it's just really important to realize that because a lot of times we think of, like, God's predestination as, okay, well, God ordered, like, it's like dominoes falling. It's, I mean, it's not, that's not at all, I mean, technically there's secondary causes, but God is outside of space and time. He's, he's divine order beyond all being. So for him to affect the created order is incomprehensible, literally, to us. Yeah. And so... 
there's no way for me to impede as well. There's, there's nothing I can do that's even conceivably possible. No star, no universe, no solar system, no cosmic power, no Superman. There's there's no ability if you have if you're made up of stuff, material or immaterial stuff. Like it's just so. In that sense, for God then to awaken my heart by grace in this in this kind of ma- like almost magical way, a miraculous way, more accurately. Um, it's it's sort of an amazing thing, but it can't impede my. It doesn't actually. Um, it's not like it's two wills conflicting in me. It's just enabling me, opening me, opening me up to see what is what is true and good and real towards my good. Because providence is ordered to one end, and that end is really the same as its beginning, namely divine goodness. That's the sole foundation, as everyone says, of predestination. And Aquinas here is exactly uh, arguing for what Augustine said, but also what the reformers will say. Well, this is going to bring me to my next point, because it is funny on uh, on 177 in footnote 171, Peter Kreef makes an interesting comment. It kind of brings us back to the beginning of our discussion uh, where he says, St. Thomas is as strong as Calvin on the absolute sovereignty of God. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, Thomas was a Calvinist then. But but also what's well, important about the remember that is predestination in the Reformation was pri- at least early on was primarily to say that it's, you're saved by grace. And not by congruent merit that you can, that you just do what's in you and God honors your effort. Like that's, predestination is always so that grace is free, which yeah. is exactly what Aquinas is doing. We get locked up in like, is it the imputation or the infusis or like, no, no, stop, stop. That's later scholastic and helpful. No, don't get me wrong. But the actual reason for predestination is to say that God's grace is free. And that's yeah. precise, that's the same argument that Aquinas is making. It's not reliant on um, uh, foreseen merit in particular is what he says, um, or that we would make good use of it. Any of any category, yeah. it is solely reliant on the, the single cause of predestination is God's goodness before all time, before sequence, before everything else, which is what Augustine and the reformers are saying. And that's a foundation of why we believe in things like justification by faith and so on, or a foundation, I should say. Yeah, it's just interesting because I mean, it just he's allowing he's allowing he's giving kind of like philosophical categories to allow scripture to speak for in the way that it actually just does when you read the the the, the text, right? Like we'll we will sometimes talk about how you know God ordains not only ends but means is the same way of kind of getting at this, where it's like okay, God in terms of divine foreordination, everything is absolute, nothing can affect it; it's up to God. But when it comes to the effects, of course. You know, God uses secondary causes. So things like me sharing the gospel with somebody, me praying for somebody, that person praying, you know, all those things can be contributing factors to it in terms of like the means towards that end. Um, and so, I mean, he's he's just he's saying the same things, just using kind of different categories. And so I think there is good grounds then for somebody who would identify as being reformed to hold to Thomas's views of providence and predestination and not feel like you know, you're compromising anything of like your Protestantism or whatever. I think R.C. Sproul, if I remember correctly, thinks that he, he would concur with Aquinas on this, on these articles. I wonder how this relates to questions of compatibilism then too, right? Because it's not quite a compatibilist argument that just, oh, the, the two somehow coexist together. He's like, Thomas is actually like explaining it. This actually, now that I think about it, this almost, maybe I need to think a little bit more, but it almost made compatibilism seem like a stupid argument. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would. I don't know if it's stupid. I, I, the, I don't want to say that absolutely at this point. But well, as I'm as I've been thinking about it, it's like, oh, like he's actually explaining how it can be the case that somebody can be genuinely free and yet God be in absolute control of all things. Well, I think the problem with compatibilism, like, and I've at one point I held to it, like when I was like twenty or something. Remember, is, compatibilism, as far as I understand, was our first really articulated by Anthony Flew. Um, you know, if you read his, if you read his book, there is a God where he talks about, you know, how he converted from being an atheist to a deist. He actually says in there, he's like, I'm the one who came up with the whole category of compatibilism, which is interesting given at the time he was a very hostile atheist. Right. Yeah. So like, how useful is it? Well, I, but I think the the biggest problem in my opinion with it is I'm thinking about this now. So maybe I'll say it a bit off is that it implies that God is of an order of being that is much greater than us, but not but still within the same sort of great yeah, almost like the highest in a chain of being kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that what Aquinas is really good at is saying that God's it just, 
he's not even like the way that we process sequence and time and space like god's not even in all that so the way in which his the level of first order causality can enable the contingent free choice is in such a way that there's no there's no compatibilism or incompatibilism that's not even a category that you can use given the doctrine of god that he has articulated i think from scripture, but then also from reasoning out the, the implications of scripture, namely that God is simple, immutable, impassable, and so on. So that that's for me, if you're a classical theist, in my opinion, you don't need compatibilism because it implies a view of God that is not compatible with classical theism, or I would argue scripture. And yeah. so like I would go with what I think William Perkins goes with as articulated by um Richard Muller. Muller. Yeah. Um I think synchronic contingence, it is a different word, but basically the idea is that God can will your free choices and you can will them too, because they're on totally different orders of causality, which is what Aquinas says. He just, it's, you know, obviously you can't judge Aquinas in the, it was a 13th century by a 17th century writers. It's, it's yeah. different context, but it's a very similar idea. I'm sure a scholar would probably have different stuff. That so they want to what with. you are saying there is that because we can't make those kinds of anachronistic judgments, then Thomas really isn't a Calvinist. Then. <laughs> He's definitely not a Calvinist. <laughs> but, but I do think Calvin's doctrine of predestination is Augustinian, and, and so is actually. A, yeah, that's probably the better way to put it, right? They're just both right. Augustinians. <laughs> yeah, they're Augustinian. And, and, but it's not even a, like we say Augustine, but it's, it's also like a wide predestination. Pauline. Ooh, like I, I think that's a weird um and I think Calvinists need to be careful to say that because you almost make it sound like no one ever ble- it's always been there yeah that's <laughs> always enable the, the point was always about the app basically it's the application of grace and time it's like if you believe in grace you, you've already believed in predestination to some degree whether you nuance it here to preserve this or that I mean even the even the original you know Jacob Arminius was much closer sure. to you know <laughs> like yeah, Arminius was a better theologian than many Reformed theologians are today. Yeah, yeah it's like... <laughs> At least so, he had a better view of God. I, I Now, I know this is my college experience and, and it's just some limited conversations with some Christians in recent years, but we've almost... Some of us become fatalist, which is one of the original heresies that even Irenaeus is fighting against. We cannot be fatalists because the, the whole Bible does say, like, choose this day whom you will serve, you know. The uh, fact that God gives commands means that he assumes that we can do them <laughs> yeah there, you, ha, you, you can't just discount the whole tenure of scripture that hold us accountable for our actions so there has to be something like free choice but then you can't discount all the bible verses that talk about god's um foreknowledge predestination calling power uh control the word sovereignty is not really in the bible unless you mean dominion or kingship but those ideas it's funny, sovereignty is not in the Bible. As, I mean, it is in the Bible, if you think of it, is in terms of... Yeah, like Nebuchadnezzar and so. Yeah. Uh, where, where, like, do we, in this creeped version, do, they, do we ever get into uh, original sin and things like that? I don't know if we... His, like, I'm assuming... Skips, we, like, we have to go to... um, Like, I don't know if next week we should just go to, like, question 27, because we have to get into processions of God. Like, creep can completely skips processions which is oh, like yeah no there's something this is yeah because i think we said this at the beginning of the podcast right there's this, something that we have to follow him. there's some stuff we're gonna have to probably pull from the the actual like maybe aquinas.cc or something like that yeah like the power of god section is the next chapter we'll, we can look at i mean it's, it's honestly stuff we've kind of gone through and then yeah. divine beatitude like i almost think that oh, we... that, one's, that one's fun oh it's only one little thing but yeah, that'd be cool we could i almost feel like we could summarize this, but maybe we could do processions next time because I would just make it more. It's just the fun topics. It, like, like I want to be able to go through most of this, but at the same time, there's some things that are just a bit of a repetition. They're good, by the way. The power of God stuff's really good. Like whether God can make the past not to have been. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we All should right. talk about the Trinity because once he starts getting into creation, he'll start talking about the Trinity. Um, but yeah, it doesn't appear anywhere. Like, he doesn't talk about it. in in Kreef's version. We don't have anything Trinity, right? No, that's yeah. And I, I, he is trying to understand the philosophical parts of Aquinas. Yeah. I, I kind of get that, but we really like, in my opinion, we should next maybe next time we should focus on like twenty seven to twenty nine that um, that kind of area, which yeah. is on the um so processions, relations, and persons, which are all really the same question. 
Yeah. Um, and then we can maybe just touch on the power of God. I think it'd just be fun to get into Trinity because Aquinas is so good on God, uh, the Trinity, God, the, the revelation of God is the Trinity. Sure. And we've so long focused on the sort of preamble to the meat, and then the meat skipped in the in the yeah. edition. I, I was just thinking too. I mean, it must. This must be. He must be focusing on philosophy of this because yeah, there's no trinity. There's no. It doesn't look like there's anything on on sin, right? Because when we start, this is to go back to what we we're talking about a minute ago. Is that when we think of when we we confuse a lot of times modern reform people confuse the question of like freedom of the will, right? And basically just say no, sin has affected the will. We can't do anything good. It's like whoa. whoa. First, you have to establish what is the will, how it's right. free in relation to other faculties of the soul, what the will is actually oriented towards as the good, all that kind of stuff. We're really, yep, the will is free. And we're trying to relate that not to questions of sin, but providence, like he's just done. Right. But then you have to factor in sin at some point because sin affects the soul. Regarding to sin, you're enslaved to sin. So there's, there, you have to have different categories. I'm free to choose strawberry ice cream, but I'm yeah. not free to not choose God without his enabling grace. <laughs> I'm not free to not yeah. sin. Um, okay, let's stop here and maybe we should do 27 to 29. We'll, we'll look into it, see if it's too much, but like those kinds of questions for next time. Sound yeah, good? we can do that. And then after that, do the Trinity stuff. Well, and then get... 29 is the Trinity stuff. It's perception. Oh, okay. Well, should, well, we should do power and beatitude first. Well, let's, and let's, then... let's look at it. I, I would just say like, if it's um if it's quick to do, we can maybe just kind of like overview it, but it might be hard. We'll, we'll read it and figure that out for next time. Okay, that sounds All good. Right.